Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 48. This is a show where two guys sit down and talk about all things Anglican with the help of our contributors. It occurred to me, though, this morning before we started taping, if this is the most important show you're watching this week, you need to get cable, you need to get an antenna for your TV, you need to get out more. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And today is August 18th, 2012. Yeah, this is to humanely uh, attest to see these, uh, how humane these bark colors are. Okay. This is a six level. Six levels. <laughs> oh, okay, there's level one. <laughs> a little, little shot there. <laughs> Just a second. <laughs> and a little bit of bite to it. <laughs> 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 that was four. I think. I saw. <laughs> <laughs> and number six, this is the final one that I go. Oh, ah, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Give me a hug. <laughs> George, let's move on to our first story this week, and we're going to talk about the uh, the mission formerly known as EMEA. What's what's the new name, George? Society for Mission and Apostolic Works. Okay. A long, long time ago, in a province far, far away, they used to be part of the of the Anglican Church. They were under Rwanda. Um, there was a falling out, and uh, uh, Amiya had to find new canonical residents somewhere. Uh, for a period of time, like a week, they were in Kenya, then they went to Congo, they bounced around back and forth, and uh, they had a lot of difficulty finding somebody who would support somebody who would not fall under authority. Um, they found a couple retired um, archbishops who said, okay, we'll try it. The latest news now is that there's a letter went out on behalf of Chuck Murphy from two African bishops that I've never heard of before. Yep. Um, two bishops, Bishop Nathan Kiamwanwiya of the Diocese of Bunyora Kataro of the Church of Uganda, and Bishop Edmund Amoa of the Diocese of Dunkwa on Ofen, in the Church of the Province of West Africa, oh, very have good. written to the AMIA <laughs> clergy who have not yet uh, made up their mind where they're going, saying, we on behalf of Bishop Murphy will offer you canonical residence. Make up your mind by August 31st. Now, this now, came out of the blue, Kevin. I didn't. This really surprised me when I heard about this. And we've contacted people within the Anglican Church and within the Anglican Church of North America, and they're like, we don't know what he's trying to do now. This is just, you know... Uh, according to people we talked to, Chuck Murphy thinks that uh, just having a bishop recognizes you makes you Anglican uh, and, and makes all the clergy under you Anglican. And uh, it's, it's, it's a big reach for a desperate person. It, but what's most surprising here is my understanding of the Holy Spirit is not that he does a new thing every week. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're hearing God tell you that he's doing a new thing every week, you need to get your hearing aid check. You know, God is fairly consistent yes. about things. And th there's, this is just so wrong on so many different levels. First off, this idea that if you're, uh, a bishop recognizes you, that makes you Anglican, that's been tried, and that failed. In Australia, there was a bishop named Ross Davies, and he recognized all these TAC bishops as assistants, traditional Anglican communion bishops, as assistant bishops for the Diocese of the Murray. And for a while there was the argument, well, these guys are Anglican bishops because Bishop Ross Murray says it so. Well, it didn't pan out more than a week because the Anglican Church of Australia said, sorry, Charlie, we're not doing this. I contacted Uganda and asking about what Bishop Nathan was up to, and their response was, what? We don't know anything about this. We'll get back to you once we figure out what's going on. Just because a bishop in the back of beyond of Uganda says you can join my diocese doesn't somehow confer this Anglican mantle that the AMIA says they need to do their Apostolic Society of Mission and Works. It's 
I don't see what they're after at this point, other than the purpose, uh, rather than just keeping the institution going. Well, and that's the, the reality here is all these doors are closing for them. The Rwanda door closed, the Con Congo door closed, the Kenya door closed, the GAFCON door closed, the retired Archbishop doors closed, um, Paris, Paris USA formed here in America, um, so the ACNA is closed to this. Um, there is no way EMEA can exist in an Anglican entity uh, as we find out. Yeah, I mean, GAFCON and the Global South have spoken, and they say that the alternative to the Episcopal Church is ACNA. Mm -hmm. Get with the program. I mean, Ken, Uganda was one of the, was the, I think, the first church to turn over its American clergy to ACNA, and now they're taking Americans back in. It, it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. And, you know, I'm waiting for next week's new thing. And uh, I was going back, we were prepping for the show, and we went back to all these articles back to December. And uh, Chuck Murphy pro proclaimed then the Holy Spirit is doing a new thing, and he's taking us out of Africa. And then, uh, you know, if it was three weeks later, he's taking us back into Africa. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a very convoluted map to how uh, God really works in, in the heart of the people, in the heart of society, and, and to get the, the missional transition, transforming love of Christ out into the world. It's not by doing something new each week. God doesn't need to change the plan. If God keeps changing the plan, he's not worth following. George, let's move on to story two. We're going to talk about All Saints Pauli's Island again. Last week we talked about how Father um, Rob Graff was able to send a letter to the congregation saying, listen, it's time to choose between ACNA and EMEA. Uh, but we're going to leave it up to a, uh, a parish vote. Please show up in two weeks. I, Rob Graff, favor moving to ACNA, just so you know, and show up and vote. And we thought, hey, this is cool. The rector's in charge of the church. There's not a lot of split going on. Looks like all is well. But uh, since we had a report last, uh, uh, get, well, 10 days ago, a lot's happened, George. Yep, there have been two coups in the greater Anglican world. Uh, one in Egypt, where President uh, uh, Morsi got rid of Field Marshal Tintawi and the Muslim Brotherhood took over the Egyptian army. And at All Saints Pauli's Island, Chuck Murphy attempted a coup with three members of the vestry to get rid of Rob Graff and keep All Saints firmly under the uh, authority of the Apostolic Society for Mission and something or other. Something like that. And Chuck Murphy's coup failed. No, it did. Uh, so there's still a lot of struggle within church, and there's no place Satan works better than in church polity, especially when a church is divided about its discernment of where to go forward. Um, All Saints, Pauli's Island had no trouble leaving the Episcopal Church uh, under Chuck Murphy's authority and leadership at that time. It was obviously the right thing to do. However, at this point, the shepherd has stopped being a shepherd. Um, the shepherd is introducing something new every week. The shepherd is not leading people into relationships with Christ, but leading them to another province, to another diocese, to another location to find a safe place for his sheep when the safest place is under the, the headship of Jesus Christ. And I see a lot of difficulty here for the people in the church because this is not a situation you find very often in Anglicanism where you have a cult of personality plus the uh, Id you know, idolizing the church, plus the history and the money that's found in, in Pauli's Island, plus faithful people who are Christians. Yeah, and Kevin, personality and money, when they start to drive church issues, you know you're in a great deal of trouble mm -hmm. because you lose sight of the gospel and you lose sight of what it's all really about. And it's, it's unfortunate what's happening at All Saints Pauli's Island because a month ago at this time, they were a fairly united, fairly happy, fairly forward-thinking congregation. Now you've got a small group that is making a great deal of trouble, dividing people, dividing friends, dividing a church, and that's not the way forward. No, it's, it's, it, it should be up to the body uh, uh, where to go from here, and that's often the case, is it's left up to the, the parish to vote wh whether to leave the Episcopal Church or whether to leave EMEA and, and join. Uh, you know, a lot has really happened since Pauli's Island was first formed, and a lot's happened since Mia um, fell apart a year ago. 
and they're in a very difficult position and we ask Anglican uh, unscripted viewers to pray for the church and if you know people there to contact them and encourage them it's not the place you want to be at this time in this place you want a shepherd who's going to shepherd you in, into a relationship with Christ George let's move on now to story three we're going to talk about what happened at general convention which we've talked about before but now there's some aftermath on many different levels and you guys are going to have to follow closely. You may want to watch this segment a couple times to see and hear what really happened. Um, they took a vote there called A049, which was the provincial, no. Um, uh, uh, provincial provisional prayers uh, uh, that yes. were proposed for the blessing of same-sex unions. Provincial. I'm so Anglican. <laughs> provisional rights for same-sex blessings and relationships. And that passed. Um, it passed in the House of Bishops, House of Deputies. It's a done deal. Your job as a reporter, my job as a reporter, is to find out what bishops and, and laypersons voted in favor of this because it should be part of the public r record. Um, and people want to know. And people send us emails all the time saying, hey, who did what? And, well, George, what did we find out? Uh, we found out that we can't find out. I have been badgering in the Episcopal News Service ever since the day of the vote, and finally I got an email from Gregory Straub, the secretary of the General Convention. Now, Father Straub is retiring at the end of this year, and his job is to oversee the publication of the convention's journal. And he sent me an email this week and saying that while I have access to the material, the AO49 votes, I do not have the staff to dedicate to retrieving the information for you in a timely way. I'm busy producing the summary of actions, the constitution and canals, canons and journals of the conventions, all of which have deadlines. It will be in due course available through the archives. This is what Father Straub wrote. Oh, so Basically, oh, 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 oh. I'll get it one day. Yeah, well, hold on. It, it, it's not his job to tell you. I, if I remember correctly, you and I worked with the Episcopal News Service for many years. You ask them the question, and they may have it haw, but eventually they'll come up with the information. Right, and, and remember the same week that I got this email from Gregory Straub was the week the ENS announced that 10 staffers at 10 positions at the Episcopal Church Office in New York have been eliminated, and to make money they've rented a floor at the Episcopal Church Center to the Consul General of Haiti. I'm not sure who took the credit rating for the uh, Haitian <laughs> tenant, but well. Uh, the, 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 point, the point being is... Uh, in the past, I would never have been. In, Gregory Straub would never have contacted me because the press office would handle such requests. Now, because they've cut back so drastically, they're pushing this off onto people in the administration of the Episcopal Church, who really don't have. It's not their job to field questions from the press. So I can't. I'm not trying to beat up on Gregory Straub and say, "Oh, woe is me. We're not getting answers when we want them," but it's just saying, you know. The Episcopal Church is just unable to communicate anymore. Well, and that's that's a big truth of all this. Is General Convention has um, results, and one of those results is they they gutted 815 and they're going to try and sell it, uh, or rent out space, or do what they can to recoup money. Uh, they're gutting the staff because they don't have the budget for it, and uh, all these consequences are showing themselves to us as press people because we can't get the answers we want when we need them. There is no reason they should have passed you off to uh, Mr. Straub, that you should have easily had an answer from uh, anybody in the ANS office, um, but that's not going to happen anymore. Now, you and I have interactions with all 39 provinces in mm -hmm. the Anglican Communion. All have different levels of press um, functionality or communication functionality. Um, a great example of a diocese with a good communications officer would be the Diocese of Fort Worth. Yeah, I, I mean, I can think of just on one hand the superior communication officers at work today in the Anglican world. I mean, I have a disproportionately high number of Fort Worth stories, Diocese of Sydney stories, Diocese of London stories, on, on Anglican Inc. and the Church of England newspaper, and it's not because Fort Worth and Sydney are the center of the universe, it's because they have pros running their shops. And so if something's interesting happening, I'll find out about it. Yeah. 
if something's happening that's interesting in uh, I don't know let's uh, let's just pick a place Chicago I won't know what's going on no unless it shows up in the police blotter and, and <laughs> true <laughs> very true and, and that's the the difficulty is George and I will learn stories we're reporters and we're out there hunting news all the time now we can find the bad stories real easy but we want you know communications officers to provide us good stories or good leads to help uh, promote the good in the church the good news of the church and that's just not happening uh, 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 one of my favorite communication officers was uh, Peter Frank um, who was on the phone all the time and said you need to know this you may be interested in this um, if you cover this we'll kill you you know these types of things but you know Peter he was honest and, and forthright and he had the the ability to make good stories interesting. Well, I'll give you a concrete example. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Kevin, the Archbishop of Nigeria, Nicholas Oko, was at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. Wow. How did really? you and I find out about it? <laughs> well, two hours before he was scheduled to speak, we got a call from Auburn Trasick, yeah. former editor of the Christian Century, uh, Christian Challenge, excuse me, uh -huh. telling us, do you know Archbishop Oko is in Washington? It's what? <laughs> what? I knew he was going to be in Indianapolis later this month, but I didn't know he was at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, so, George and I wanted to, even if you don't have the money, having a good communications office, no matter what province you're in, really helps the news. George and I can find news, but that's not the kind of news you want to get out, the stuff that can be found. You want the, the news <laughs> to get out that's the good news of what's happened in your diocese and province. And if you need to call Susan Gill and ask how it's done, uh, please do so. I, I'm not going to put her email on there, but I'm sure you could do a, a, a quick word search on Google and find her. Because as Kevin says, we'll always find out what's, who's, uh, who's uh, in the drunk tank, but <laughs> if good things happen, it's very hard for us to find out unless we're told. Amen. Welcoming back to the show, the guy across the pond, Peter Old, for his segment on Anglican Unscripted. We had a, a week off here, so we got a break. You guys had uh, some sporting event over there. I'm not sure. We had the Olympics. Oh, um, was it the Olympics? It was a fantastic per capita table uh, produced in one of the, the newspapers here, which was basically medals per capita. Um, we stuffed you over there. I, I, I'm sorry, we don't go by per capita because we got all this land we have to fill up. And yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but I think what we had 49 golds. I I don't remember. What did we, you guys? We actually had a, a tremendously good. Uh, yeah, Olympic. you guys did. Yeah. 49 golds, 56 medals in total. Yeah. Um, it was superb. It was much more than we expected. The whole thing has been really cool, and we got the Paralympics coming in two weeks' time. Yeah, that's just great. To add and I got to say, the security was great. Uh, the the was yeah. the traffic jams that they were going to talk about. Uh, you guys, you, you pulled it off. The first couple of days, I'm looking at all the empty seats, but yeah. you know, other than a, a small few glitches, uh, congratulations. Yeah. So I well, the I, empty seats were because people didn't want to go and see it. The empty seats were for delegations that didn't turn up. So yeah, yeah that happens. So I, I once in a while I open up a London paper and I read articles. And there's an article by a guy named Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey John. Jeffrey John. John yeah. Jones, Jones, Johns. Let me edit that. And there's an article by Jeffrey Johns. So, mm -hmm. like, uh, he says, Rowan has ruined everything and put uh, the gays back. And he's, you know, his whole time as a bishop has been for naught. Yeah. You forgot to mention that he did it at the same time that he's republishing a book. Oh, so, had a book. so there's a reason behind it, not just to trash Rowan Williams. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, Jeffrey John's book, Permanent Stable Faithful, which was uh, published almost 20 years ago as a, um, a kind of case for Christian same-sex unions, has been republished with a new sub, 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 subtitle, uh, Christian Same-Sex Marriage, uh, uh, just in time for the government cons consultation on same-sex marriage. Um, and it was accompanied by a wonderfully polemic hyperbole in the Guardian newspaper um, with the usual kind of stuff that, that Rowan Williams is, is a traitor to the liberal cause and that conservatives are really evil and demonizing gay people and all the usual stuff that we hear. 
Jeff well, B. John seems to be in the papers about once a month now, almost on the month. It's like there's a strategy or something. Okay, let's tell our viewers who we got lots of new viewers. Last yeah. week, last week, our viewership grew by sixteen percent. Oh, way. awesome. <laughs> this week, I'm on. It's going to explode. So, t tell our new viewers who Jeffrey uh, Jeffrey is. Jeffrey John is currently the, the Dean of St. Albans uh, Abbey. He was nominated in 2003 by the Bishop of Oxford to become the Stockton Bishop of Reading. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is he's basically one of the most outspoken gay activists, uh, clergy in the church, and he was in a uh, relationship. And so there was a huge sort of outcry, basically, and at the time. The the protector of the church, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, got wind of this, and she cl uh, allegedly called Rowan in the office. And what happened there? Allegedly. Uh, I can't. Uh, well, I can't com confirm that that story. That is, uh, I've actually had nobody tell me, um, confirm to me the story that basically the Queen said, "I will not approve this." Full stop. Uh huh. But so, uh, basically, Ron met with the Queen. After meeting with the Queen, he met with uh, uh, Jeffrey Johns and said, listen, it's not going to happen. Uh, then we have to be fair to our viewers, Kevin, to, yeah. to say that that is an apocryphal story. I, I haven't heard it shared. I'm not sure it might have happened like that. It could have happened, allegedly. Okay. But but Peter, you re you read the Telegraph, you read all these these newspapers yeah. in in London. Certainly, who what happened? Who make a thousand accusations, uh, hoping that you will deny some so they can find the real story? I can tell you what what certainly happened yeah. was a, a tremendous coalition in Oxford that the sort of evangelical churches, traditional Catholic churches that came together and basically went to the bishop and said, "If you appoint Jeffrey John, uh, our money stops and we will bankrupt you in, sure. in, inside a year." Uh -huh. um, so. The o o Oxford Diocese was was facing bankruptcy if it did it as okay. well. So uh, you, we're having big discussions now in London and in the Church of England about what to do about same-sex blessings down yeah. the road. Uh, I saw something in the Changing Attitudes blog. Uh, yeah, a little, what's, what's a little going interesting on? line just dropped in there. Yeah. Um, Colin Cowder, Changing Attitude, uh, one of the revisionist leaders here, just mentioned in passing. But he'd been told that all of the Church of England diocesan bishops had been written to by the current working party, sort of doing a, a report on, on human sex, sexuality, asking them how they have implemented the 2005 pastoral statement on civil partnerships. So in 2004-2005, the late the government introduced civil partnerships, which are basically civil unions. And the Church of England basically responded by saying, clergy can enter civil partnerships, but they need to be celibate. And we would expect our diocesan bishops, when they find out that a clergy member has entered a civil partnership, to confirm that it is a celibate civil partnership. Mm -hmm. Now, that has been practiced in some dioceses, and some dioceses it's been blatantly ignored. Um, but what's interesting is that apparently this, this working group has gone to all, the, all 44 bishops and said, tell us how you've implemented this. Wow. Well, yeah, that is. It's interesting because here in America we have a complete separation of church and state. Yes. You know, the, the government can't really write to a, a, ch a church and say, tell us how you're doing something. In yes. your country, they work hand in hand. Kind of hand in hand, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, yeah. There, there's an accountability of the church to the state and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Formally, though, though informally they kind of let us get on with, with what we want to do. But up yeah. to a point. Is there a point that we're going to be looking at a separation of the church and the state in London and in, or in England? I don't. I I, I think if if we get same sex marriage, mm -hmm. and if the Church of England basically says it's not going to happen, we're going to oppose it, and uh, there are there are problems. I, I think we we may see disestablishment at some point. Mm. Wow. Um, but the problem here is that a lot of Christians, a lot of people who go to church just just have never had the the, the experience of being countercultural right you know so they've never had had a situation where they are the ones going against the flow where they have to stand up for something be counted for it and to pay a price for that and and so that's what's what what, what i think is beginning to emerge now we may be going to a position where that actually actually happens for us that would be interesting so you're saying the church is now the punk rockers of the 70s I'm saying that, well, I'm saying that the church could be like 
hipster but slightly cooler and slightly more funky um, and slightly more theologically sound. Um, that's 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 what could uh, what could happen. Of, of course, there are large elements in the church. You know, wheat and tares. The sure. large element of the tares who 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 want to you know who basically say, look how how God is speaking through the culture and telling us about gay liberation and we need to catch up and uh, that's just a load of rubbish really but, yeah you know yes. so so uh, um uh colin Cowell on this church of, on this changing attitude blog was also dropping hints about you know he expects a bishop to be out of inside the next year and all that kind of stuff and 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 it, it could just get very very messy very quickly i think it, it it could be like, if you look at, say, uh, the Syrian civil war, it began with a few rebels just kind of, you know, uh, taking pot shots and so on, and suddenly it just got worse and worse, and suddenly they were in the middle of a civil war. And I wonder whether that, that, that's what might happen to the, to the Church of England, is that we just get more and more stuff, and suddenly we kind of look around and we go, hang on a minute, we're at each other's necks here. Welcoming back Alan Haley, the lay canon of lay canons, who's not officially a canon, the lawyer of lawyers. How are you doing today? Just fine. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. We're going to talk about the Diocese of South Carolina quickly. Um, they're kind of in this middle of this clash lyric, um, the famous man who's saying, should I stay or should I go now? <laughs> and uh, um, it's an interesting time for the church uh, because Mark Lawrence's on vacation where he said, I'm going to you know, sit down and think about where I'm going to go and right. what I'm going to do and he he's left with several choices as a bishop but also as a diocese what are those okay well first of all yeah the action you have to distinguish between the actions that he could take as bishop and the actions they could take as a diocese mm -hmm. because technically the bishop simply presides over the diocesan convention and doesn't have a vote there so it's a decision by the diocese if they want to change their governing documents to like the uh, diocese of San Joaquin and Fort Worth and Pittsburgh and Quincy, they could change their governing documents, their constitution, so as to no longer accede in any way to the constitution or canons of the Episcopal Church, and then they would no longer qualify as a diocese in that church. Then they would have to affiliate with some other branch of the Anglican Communion, uh, if not ACNA. So, well, the, to, to interrupt you quick, they already did fiddle a little bit with the canons at the last convention. Did. What they did was they said that they would not uh, recognize the new Title IV disciplinary canons, mm -hmm. and that is going to create fertile ground perhaps for, if ECOSA wants it, if uh, 815 and Catherine Jeffers Shorey want it, to create a monumental confrontation. But I'll take up that in a minute. So. What they also said was that the constitution of the Diocese of South Carolina uh, trumps anything to the contrary in the church constitution. So they took a position much like Quincy did in 1991, saying that they would reserve the right to decide. And they've always had that right. You know, people have this mistaken idea that general convention can sit up on high and pass constitutional amendments and canons, and all the dioceses are thereby legally bound by them. That's nonsense. Yeah, the dioceses are independent functioning entities. The uh, general convention doesn't function except for two weeks out of every three years. So there's nothing it can do in between, and the dioceses have to do all the work. And just for example, in all the change to the disciplinary canons, um, which general convention now is being asked to reconsider some of its follies there, um, the, in all those changes that they made at the national level, none of it worked until the various dioceses implemented local canons and local changes to their own canons to put them into sync with what General Convention wanted. So as, had General Convention simply pronounced its canons and everybody else simply ignored them, <laughs> nothing would have taken place. So that's why I'm saying that it's the diocese who have to implement the law of the church. And um, they can decide for themselves which ones to choose, which ones to follow. Diocese of Eastern Oregon, as we know, chooses not to follow the um, canon that says you only baptized persons may take in partake of Holy Communion. And so it's been practiced for hundreds of years that the diocese choose which canons and provisions they want to follow. There would be nothing new here. So South Carolina's decision to go or leave, therefore, 
Uh, it's interesting to compare that, you know, back to the time when the South Carolina did leave the church once before, uh, in 1861, at the outbreak of hostilities in the Civil War. And at that time, they joined with about seven other di southern dioceses uh, to form the Protestant Episcopal Church in the Confederate States of America. Uh, they wrote their own canons. Uh, they continued to apply the national church canons, except to the extent they replaced them, of course, with allegiance to the Confederate States and not the United States of America. But uh, at that time, the Episcopal Church was concerned. The diocese had not left. They continued to call the roll at all the conventions, and just was no response. There was no one participating. So South Carolina could choose, if it wanted, to stay in the Episcopal Church, not withdraw or change its governing documents but simply not participate at the national level. And that would par parallel what had been done in the Civil War uh, because then eventually they came back to it. But the main point of that kind of a strategy, if they pull out from participation at the national level, they're doing two things. They're demonstrating, first of all, the national level isn't all that important to care about the day-to-day -day affairs of the diocese. Bishop Lawrence would still continue to ordain his clergy and be in control of their licensing. The Standing Committee and Bishop Lawrence could both vote on any new Episcopal candidates for office, and diocesan affairs would just run as before. The interesting thing that would happen is if um, 815 decided to try to take any disciplinary steps against Bishop Lawrence while they stayed in, and that would have to initiate proceedings in front of the Disciplinary Board for Bishops, which is a creature of the very new Title IV, which South Carolina doesn't recognize. Yeah, it's uh, that as well, but there's also an internal, uh, there are churches in the Diocese of South Carolina that want to stay Episcopal, right. uh, but they also want to be a part of General Convention. And they, so, of course, have been the instigators of these disciplinary charges, mm -hmm. who tried to file the charges as soon as the new Title IV went into effect, they wasted time. <laughs> Bishop Lawrence under it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they had the, the charges written before Title IV was written. <laughs> Fortunately, the uh, disciplinary board did not take up the charges. They were wishy-washy and, and not very worthy of anything. So it, it would be okay legally and would offer some structure if they stayed in the Episcopal Church but just did, did not attend anything. They wouldn't really have to rewrite any of their canons. They just don't show to the General Convention. There's no duty to attend general convention or participate. Okay. It's a it's a right to be a, of being a member, mm -hmm. and as a voting member, they can send one or two delegates if they want to just you know keep in with any of this falderall that's going on at the national level, and be true to their parts. And then, as I said, it was a two-part strategy that would um, cut their strategy to minimum and show thereby that national church is not that important. But the also do during that time period is they could try to forge alliances with similar conservative dioceses to um, make an organized resistance to this disorder at the top. And perhaps through something like that, a more you know concerted alliance could be formed, much the way the seven southern dioceses did during the Civil War, came together in regular conventions and meetings and decided how they would run their affairs, totally independent of the national church. So it could be done. It would be a question, as I say, three other dioceses that way or four other dioceses joining in that kind of a pact, you would have enough bishops to consecrate another bishop if they wanted to replace someone without um, having to kowtow to the whole national structure. Yeah, well, that's the, the interesting thing. I don't know if they can do the co a coalition so well now that ACTA has taken a lot of conservative dioceses with them. Um, you, we're talking maybe at tops for dioceses that I can think of. There are some moderate dioceses um, and there are certain, some retired Episcopal bishops that would want to participate in this, but I, I, I don't see the, the earnestness of um, anybody who's not already left for ACNA. Well, strategy would have to, yeah, it would probably need more than just four dioceses. Um, mm -hmm. There's the communion partner diocese to be considered first of all. and. It would have to, because the safety is in, and strength is in numbers, if it's 
10 or 11 dioceses unite together like this, then uh, Catherine Jefford Shorey cannot depose the bishops of all of them. Yeah. And if she did, she'd be in for a total Donnybrook of canon law here. So uh, there's, as I say, safety and strength in numbers, but it's where they're just acting one by one by themselves that it's, she's managed to pick them off and, and start the lawsuits and so on. George, uh, I guess last week or two weeks ago, we, we lamented the fact that the Crown Commission was meeting in secret, but we couldn't get any information out of it. Uh, you and I as reporters want to know about the most important story of the next decade. Who is going to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury? I want to know. You want to know. We know the people who do know, but they won't tell us anything. Part of the problem with gathering information is having people like the reporters of London who have connections, money, and not the scruples you and I have. <laughs> <laughs> they were able to gather some information and uh, got some of the secrets out of the Crown Commission. Our, our good friend Ruth Gladhill uh, printed a story and she's got some pretty good in intel. Yes, the last uh, Thursday and Friday of July the Crown Nominations Committee met and created a short list. And according to Ruth Gladhill, on this short list are Archbishop Johnson Tom of York, Bishop James Jones of Liverpool, Bishop Graham James of Norwich, Bishop Christopher Coxworth of Coventry, and Bishop Justin Welby of Durham. All of those are people that we listed in our, uh, I think it was episode 41, you said, of yeah. Anglican Unscripted, where we went through the Canterbury sweepstakes. Yeah, 41 and 42 have five of the finalists in each of those. Now, what's interesting here is you and I know that the Archbishop of Canterbury has to play a dual role. He's the kind of the idyllic uh, icon of all of Anglicanism. He's, he's kind of the, the, the first among the equals. He's also in charge of the Church of England. has to keep things running there. And the Church of England right now is in a mess. Yes. They've gone through a lot of uh, political turmoil the last uh, uh, six years. Well, Kevin, to be fair, it's been in a mess for about 400 years. But okay. in the last six <laughs> years, it's really been in a mess. Nobody's been, been, been beheaded in the last six years. But yes, for, I'll give you the 400-year mark. And the, the next Archbishop of Canterbury has to serve the, the dual purposes. He has to keep the Anglican Communion together, which Rowan William has not been able to do. And he has to keep the Church of England together, which Rowan William has, has also not been able to do. Rowan Williams has not been a very good politician. He's not been able to get General Senate to do what he wants to do, and he certainly has failed miserably in getting the wider community to do what he wants to do. Okay. And on uh, this list, Kevin, I only think that there's one person who the Global South would even consider being acceptable. Well, uh, yeah, Johnson Tamu, who is, um, came from uh, Uganda, would probably be the one person that they would call traditional or conservative, but he's more he's probably not to their perfect liking. I, there's, they would probably want a Richard Charters or somebody who's uh, uh, more of the conservative traditionalist or traditional conservative. It's Michael yeah. Nazarelli, Richard Charters, sure. there are people like that in the Church of England, but they're not on this list. No, they're not. Uh, Frank Griswold's not on the list. I, you know, <laughs> well, there's, there is no death wish on the Crown <laughs> Nominations <laughs> Committee, I'm afraid. <laughs> but the, uh, thinking of Frank Griswold, there are some wonderfully two-faced people on this list. Yeah, I saw People that. who have the ability to be liberal in one group, talking to one group, and to be conservative when talking to another group. Guys who can just talk she the talk and be as smooth and just beautiful. They don't stand for anything, but they fill out a suit really well. Well, they do. They can change their mind on a plane trip. And that's, that's, that's an amazing gift. What will give you more reporting as we learn more about what's coming in from the Crown Commission? Uh, you know, they're coming up on a deadline. They're going to have to, you know, before so, uh, December sometime, uh, approach the Queen and say, here's the, uh, uh, our nominee, what do you think? And, you know, this is going to probably be her last Archbishop. She's gone through quite a few, but uh, um, what do, do, do you think she would uh, give forward uh, Johnson to him? I think she, yes, Johnson, Tom, all of these people she would appoint. I don't think mm -hmm. that any of them have any failings. It's just that what would work for the Church of England is not going to work for the Anglican Communion, and what would work for the Anglican Communion is not going to work for the Church of England. The time really has come to separate the two positions. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
George, story six, we're going to talk about some uh, international Anglican job postings. Um, the first, somebody is going to get a brand new job at the Vatican working for the Anglicans. Who wants to live in Rome and why do we have an Anglican post in Rome? Well, the Anglican Center in Rome is the, essentially it's the embassy, it's the Archbishop of Canterbury's formal representative to the, to the Roman Catholic Church. It also is a study center, and it's a really nice little position to represent the uh, Anglican Communion to the wider Catholic world. And the last person just retired. He's the former Dean of Melbourne, Australia. And traditionally, this job has been held by white liberals from England, Australia, and the United States. Okay. If I remember correctly, there was an Arctic meeting in Hong Kong. And I don't know why we have these meetings, because it really makes the, the Romans wonder about Anglicans. That didn't go so well. Well, we had the Anglican Roman Catholic International Consultation Meeting, ARCIC, yeah, as Arctic. you said, <laughs> in Hong Kong. And they were talking about moral issues. And at the end of the meeting, the, what, the head of the Anglican delegation, the Archbishop of New Zealand, David Moxon, said, and oh, by the way, we don't have a common moral teaching also because we think homosexuality is okay while you Catholics think it's bad. Now this came as a bit of a shock to the other Anglicans on the delegation because uh, no one had decided except the Archbishop of New Zealand that homosexuality had been moved from the sin column to the virtue column in the moral uh, moral balance sheet. He did it to 10 Lambeth 110 meetings I guess. Well all right moving on the Anglican Communion Press Office also has a posting uh, for a job in Africa, somebody who's going to cover African news. This is significant on a second level, but we'll talk about later. What's the deal with this press? Well, the uh, Anglican Communion, uh, Anglican Consultative Council will pay for somebody to work in Lusaka to spend one day a week covering this church of the province of Central Af Africa and the rest of the week covering the news of the wider church in Africa. Basically, this is going to be the mouthpiece for London in Africa explaining African news to the Africans uh, from a London perspective. Which is really, you know, <laughs> in all bad ways bad. Um, you don't need, <laughs> since colonization, anybody from London telling Africans their own news. And it, there's more of a second purpose to this and that's really to have this behind the scenes undercover in Daba going on uh, in the press. Yeah. If you, don't, if you say something we don't like, we cut off the money, and therefore uh, the, the ride's over, folks. Yeah. Um, it's a way to buy access. It's a way to buy public opinion in the church in Africa. And George, Kevin, how could you know this? Well, you just go back to where the money's coming from. George, where's this money coming from? Uh, Trinity Wall Street. No, you, you take it back, really. So you, Trinity does fund some uh, some good things. Their money has uh, really done gone to help a lot of things. But as far as communicating uh, the gospel, they're not really good at that. They're communicating liberalism is very good. And buying press officers in Africa, uh, kudos. You got the money to do it, do it. George, we're going to talk about a topic that sometimes we get in trouble for, um, but we're about transparency. The people who watch this show about transparency and the success of the church has always been through transparency. We watched the Episcopal Church fall into dismal and despair and collapse because they kept so many things a secret, a lot of the polity and politics. Um, the success of the ACN and the Anglican Church of North America has been through transparency and letting things be out in the open and discussed in full. You and I are going to talk about affinity dioceses, and we're talking about it because I saw a report last week that my good friend, Archbishop uh, Duncan, flew into San Francisco to perform some ordinations. And on first glance, that's not a big deal. He flies all over to consecrate bishops and to, he ordains people all the time in Pittsburgh. But I've never seen him fly to San Francisco to do it. And I sent an email to you, or you and I conversed about it, and said, what's going on here? And what did you find out? Well, I contacted Bishop Eric Meniz, the Diocese of San Joaquin. San Joaquin has congregations in the Bay Area, as does the Diocese of Pittsburgh. And I asked uh, the question, uh, why is Archbishop Duncan having to fly out? Why can't you do this? And also, is this because Pittsburgh ordains women and San Joaquin does not? Bingo! There's the answer. 
Sure. Um, we've got the uh, women's ordination issue causing uh, a new diocese to be formed out of congregations that geographically uh, should either be in Western Anglicans under Bill Thompson or San Joaquin under Eric Meniz, or even the Diocese of the West of the Reformed Episcopal Church. Right. There's not a lack of Anglican cover for California. No, and this is a part of affinity. We, have, w w we are kind of the affinity experiment here in the Anglican Church of North America. I remember, though, New Zealand tried this. New Zealand in the 90s decided to have uh, ethnic or cultural dioceses. They divided the country so you have uh, Paheka, or which is the Maori term for white people, white people dioceses like Christchurch, Dunedin, and so on. And then you have Maori dioceses, or Hui Aurongas, uh, I believe that's the word. So that the church in New Zealand is divided along racial lines. Now, affinity dioceses as a whole work pretty well, but they come with an Achilles heel. Uh, a great example, I think, is Forward in Faith. Forward in Faith has seemed to work uh, because it is fairly grounded and a fairly long-term institution that people have a common doctrine, a common understanding of the sacraments, a common understanding of the prayer book and scripture. And then we have other types of entity diocese that are nation or nationally based. Yeah, we have what's going on this uh, in a week or two. Um, the Archbishop Oko of Nigeria is setting up a Cana diocese in Indianapolis uh, or in that area. Um, it's not going to be geographical based, I, I hope, I don't, I'm not sure. And that is kind of the Achilles heel of this affinity thing is why does the Archbishop of Nigeria need to uh, provide a safe haven for Nigerians is not the Anglican Church in North America well suited enough to handle Anglicanism here in America. Yeah, and that, that speaks to my discomfort with the New Zealand experiment. Maybe mm -hmm. it's because of American history, but the idea of dioceses that are cultural or national that are for reasons other than issues of doctrine really bothers me because I don't think race or uh, national origin should be determining factors of where you go to church. I think sh it's what you believe, not who you are. Yeah, well, I think affinity in the long run can work, and I think this, there's this Ach Achilles heel, and the, the worst part about this is you're at a point now you can just choose your bishop. And that's not how Anglicanism was designed or envisioned, or the Episcopacy was envisioned, from my understanding of church history. Well, if you want to be a Congregationalist, be a Congregationalist. If you want to be an Episcopalian, you're in a church ordered and governed by bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, often they're not very good bishops, but still <laughs> that's the system we have. Yeah. And the hybrid system, I really don't think it's been working well. Yeah, it's, it's got its problems, but you know, there's not anybody under the College of Bishops in ACNA I want to, want to be under. They're all good bishops is the problem. And what we're having here is a select and choose over small doctrinal issues. And that just, it makes my head scratch a little. And th I think, you know, that may be the, the small Achilles heel of affinity dioceses where geographical dioceses have been so successful in the past. Just, a, you know, a thought and an opinion from George and Kevin, who may not have a show next week. <laughs> Welcome to the end of episode 48 of Anglican Unscripted. Kevin and George had a good time sitting down. Normally in August, it's really hard to find news. It's a slow time for reporters. Uh, a lot of the church, especially bishops and clergy, take August off. It's a time to you know, get out of town, go to the beach, get some sunburn, then come back and heal. And so George and I have trouble finding stories. Not so this week. We had plenty of stories, good stuff. Um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, last week's episode had 16% more viewers than ever before. We're, we're, we're hitting record amounts, and I, I thought it was because of Chick-fil-A, but maybe there's other reasons. I think it's the South Carolina. People mm -hmm. are wondering what's going to happen, and we won't know till the end of the month, but I think a lot of people are following that story, the possible secession of the Diocese of South Carolina from the Episcopal Church. 
It, that would be a big story. It'd certainly be the, the story of the year. Uh, we again covered the the Mia stuff uh, this week and last week. Uh, it's interesting to fi- you know to find out. Please give us the feedback of what stories you're liking to hear because I want to know why the audience grew 16% all of a sudden in in, in one week. That's amazing. Uh, we're getting up into the 30,000 viewer range, and I'm scratching my head figuring out. Like, come on, it's not because we're like Mr. and Mr. Mr. and Mr. GQ here. Something else is happening. Um, on to, to other things. We set up a brand new uh, Facebook uh, page for Anglican Unscripted. If you want to friend us there, I'm putting the link into the, uh, the show notes here. Um, please send us comments at anglicanunscripted at gmail.com. Um, it's important to hear from people about stories. Uh, we hear, got a lot of good insider information about the All, All Saints, Pauly's Island stuff from viewers. Um, it's good to get stories, George. And also, pray for us. Pray mm-hmm. for the work that we do. Pray that God enliven and enrich in our hearts. And send us your prayer concerns, thing that we, things that we can raise up and share with God on your behalf as well. See, remember, this is a ministry. Kevin and I love doing this. We are so fortunate to be able to have fun and enjoy the work that we do. But it is a ministry that is dedicated to the glory of God. Yeah, well, and we both got to admit, you know, you and I have been attacked a, a lot this week, you know, certainly with the you know, lack of encouragement and other you know, issues to, to really sit down in front of the camera once a week for three hours. That's not easy. You know, we have to be on our, our best right here in front of the camera. And, you know, to get the motivation to do it sometimes, it just isn't there. You know, what are you doing today? Ah, today's not a good day. You know, i got to go to the doctor or whatever. And to really schedule what happens here on Unscripted is not that easy. And we need your prayer and your prayer cover for, you know, keeping us from, you know, the, the things that would want to stop this show. Uh, another thing, the Anglican TV website has been updated. I've added some new features to it. Uh, it's easier to navigate. We'll be adding more of the uh, older content later on, but um, it's another thing you need to check out. Uh, and we keep updating the stories on Anglican Inc. It's a, it maybe a slow news month, but we certainly find the stories out there somewhere. And a reminder, we don't want to find the stories. We want you to help us get the stories. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 48 of Anglican Unscripted. Yeah, let's do it one more time. I, I see, th- I see the worry on your face. Don't, don't lie. Oh, that's cool. I got my daughter in the picture. There's a blooper, kid. What? Nothing. Oh, <laughs> Last try. Can 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 you have her appear in the uh, show in her park outfit, the little leader hose and she was wearing? Oh, or? that's great. Yeah, good idea. We'll see. Don't put me in it. <laughs> I will be so mad. She'll be mortified. But she'll be famous. You know? Yeah, to like five people. Thir- 36,000 people will watch Don't her. Don't do it, Dad. Oh, okay. Don't look attractive right now. Oh, I can Photoshop you. Thank you. <laughs> Three, two, one.